So this is a fantastic uh, uh, morning session. So let's get started. Uh, so you already know about Argon. Uh, I just want to say a couple very brief things as we get started. Argon here uh, uh, shown on the map. But the uh, cool thing, I hope at some time you get to visit Argon. It is out. It was uh, out in the burbs. Now this was Argon was put way outside the city, right? Uh, way, way outside the city because initially. Uh, the first uh, science experiments that were done by professors at the University of Chicago were right there uh, in the university, right? There's actually a monument there that shows uh, the, the uh, uh, first uh, reaction that was uh, taking place at the University of Chicago. And they realized, well, you know, maybe University of Chicago isn't the best place to run these experiments. Let's uh, move out where we have more space. We can develop bigger facilities. So uh, it opened in 1943. Argonne is actually the oldest of the, of the uh, open national laboratories. And I hope that you get a chance to come out. I realize the meeting is here, but sometime visit the lab. We would uh, love to have you out, uh, if possible, to talk to one of the scientists or get a tour or something. So I want to start with the fact that uh, the, the work that you're seeing today and uh, um, in the future here, the rest of the week, comes from a history at, at Argonne of developing and looking really early on at parallel computing. And uh, this is a division photograph that uh, someone has preserved from 1983. Uh, and if you look around this picture, you might be able to see some famous people. Uh, one of them is in the room, uh, for sure. But there are other people uh, that you might notice. I don't know, have you, have you picked Paul out of, the, out of the picture yet? He's right over here. All right, and uh, there are a bunch of other people uh, in this photo. Uh, I'll save it with the, uh, the stack and you can look through it later. But uh, uh, Argonne from the very beginning has been looking at what is the next architecture? What can we do? How do we push forward? How do we get scale up and do more science, more science, more science, more computational science? And of course, now we have a very large machine with which, at Argonne with which to do that science. But the key thing for this week that I think that you really want to hone in on, especially as you look at architecture, is how much effort you put into the code for the physics, for the chemistry, for the biology, and how much you put into managing the parallelism, the software engineering, the build system, the debugging. So I worked at uh, Los Alamos, uh, and in, back in 96, uh, uh, they had a big CM5. At the time, it was uh, the world's biggest, uh, I believe. And uh, John Reinders, uh, who worked there, not the same Reinders, uh, not James Reinders, one of the speakers, but John Reinders, um, uh, had this concept. He says the parallel uh, platform paradox, which was the average time required to implement a moderate-sized application on a parallel computer is equivalent to the half-life of the latest supercomputer. And at the time, people did not have very, very many frameworks. They were really porting their code directly to platforms. And every time a new platform came out, people rushed and tried to redo large sections of their code. Since that time, there's been an amazing evolution in the mechanisms and the, and the tools with which we use to port and maintain large software frameworks. So here are my recommendations for you this week as you're looking at the uh, class material. Number one, start looking for other people's libraries. It's, a, it's amazing how many, how many people write d dense uh, matrix multiply or their own sparse matrix uh, package or their own uh, uh, gridding uh, piece of software. You know, they, they all start from, oh, I got to do this. So they, they, or they pull out a book or they find. And the best thing to do is to understand how to weave in other people's libraries into your code. Another thing is encapsulation. I'm going to come to that, come back to that in just a second. The second thing is embedding in your code. So this week, keep looking at everyone's techniques for embedding in your code debugging, performance monitoring, correctness detection, that's going to be a really big one, and resilience. There have been several studies about codes that don't even know whether they got the right answer, that people have gone in and they perturb one memory location, one value, and ask, in your code, did your code do any checksums? Did it do any 
uh, error correction, any detection to see at the very end, did you get an answer that you expect? So building that, these kind of capabilities, embedding capabilities in. So spend some time this week looking at embedding capabilities in. Look at the two workflows. There's a science workflow, problem setup. What does it look for someone to use your package, to use your software after you've been working on it? How do you explain the science workflow? And then there's the programmer workflow. How do I modify a piece of code? How do I test it? Make sure that you have, have written down on paper these two workflows, that you could sit down and have a lunch conversation and say, here is my science workflow, five steps. I start with this problem, I start looking at this, I transfer this equation into this piece, I add this, and here's how I get my data, and here's how I, versus the programmer workflow. Finally, work on an A plus fantastic build system one that does nightly builds eventually, even if you start out with a little test program and you're tinkering, but eventually make sure that your picture has in it, your plan for your code has all the way to, it's testing itself, I have a bunch of correctness tests, I know that the program is working, and anytime I make a change, I run, can run through this list. Also embedding software, and then finally, how to move your code to a community code. A lot of you have, have uh, pocket codes, you know, things that are in your home directory now or on uh, your hard drive. Start imagining now how you move that to a community code. How, you know, what, is the, what are the tools that you plan on using? Spend this week to start mapping that out. Okay, so here's an example of encapsulation from Mike Caro. Uh, I love this uh, slides, set of slides, which is why I've stolen it, uh, is that uh, in this, uh, he gives as an example, in this slide right here is the physics code, this physics code here. This is the physics code dedicated to MPI specific calls. Now it's blank, okay? The punchline, of course, is that he has correctly built abstractions in his code so that things like send this buffer from here to here has been removed and put into a place in his code which is exchange uh, particles or transfer force or, or uh, move or, or change the, the, the gridding, right? And so uh, what you have when a physicist looks at the code and what a computer scientist looks at the code, that these are two different parts of the code, that there's a part that represents the chemistry, the biology, the physics, that you can understand the algorithm, the applied math that's happening, and then there's an implementation which can have abstractions that go down to the low-level hardware. It's especially important as we look at all the chip features happening. Another very key thing that's happening, and I'll talk, hopefully I'll, I'll spend some more time talking about it tonight, and I just wanna say, at the very beginning of this week that equal work is not equal time. For decades, we have been programming machines where the way we tell a programmer how to write a parallel program is divide your work up into equally sized chunks, put each equally sized chunk on a node, and then run them, and they will all finish at the same time. You then have a barrier, a synchronization, a halo exchange, whatever. This is called bulk synchronous. This worked for about 15 years. This was quite effective making equal work in equal time. That is not the case now. It's not the case in the processors that, that uh, the folks from Intel are gonna talk about. Uh, it's not the case in the future processors. Uh, every part of the processor is moving at a different speed. They get, they get warm, they slow down a little bit, even different cores on the same die. So the idea that you can divide up your code and divide up your work completely evenly and then expect it all to finish is a, not a good strategy. So start right now, this week, to say, if I'm looking at my algorithm, how do I make up for latency? This example here comes from a, a machine where even just a couple memory correction errors causes, cause nodes to take an extraordinarily long time uh, because they had a, a memory fault, right? And so if your code always assigned the same work to all the nodes and waited for them all to finish, the slowest node finishes, causes your iteration to complete. You're always as slow as your slowest node. So start working now at how do I design my algorithm so equal work, uh, the understanding that equal work is not equal time. All right, and let me wrap up here with uh, um, just a couple things that are changing in history, changing in computing right now. So. 
what I just mentioned, block synchronous, this is being replaced with asynchrony and latency hiding. So looking at your algorithm, how do you do that? This sort of static partitioning per core, where you've divided up all the work per core, that's being changed, what we see in future, you want to future-proof your algorithms, that's being changed with over-decomposition, dividing it up more than the number of co cores, and then doing some sort of load balancing step. We're going from countable parallelism, where you know I'm going to divide it up into 8192 pieces, to really massive parallelism. Well, I don't know how much parallelism I'm going to have, because there are nodes that are changing how powerful they are over time. This whole socket, shared memory, is moving toward really reduced RAM per flop to software-managed memory. So the whole memory hierarchy, and we'll hear probably more about that this morning, uh, is changing. Expensive flops has been replaced with expensive data movement. So uh, in your analysis of algorithms class, if you took this in, in grad school, they a lot, almost, in fact, I, I can think about it, the only thing I remember calculating in my analysis of algorithms course in, in, uh, uh, in my PhD work was, you know, you, you compare a sort algorithm by how many compares it did. Well, the compare is, the, is now trivial. Really, you need to compare, if you're just doing the classic right, sort algorithm, you need to compare how many data movements you did, how many movements into the core and out of the core. And for your algorithms this week, as you're looking at this, uh, ignore this piece for a moment and look at data movement. That's the key to performance. This pure checkpoint restart, there'll be people talking about fault resilient strategies. And finally, this idea of uh, letting the Viz guys sort out all the data, I'll just dump it all to disk and then let someone else do it, uh, is being replaced with doing analysis in your code as you execute. So uh, think about these trends as uh, you spend the next uh, uh, several days uh, looking at the uh, software uh, that and your algorithms. I have time for one or two questions if anybody has anything, otherwise we're gonna dive right in. Yeah. Uh, when you said that the whole socket and NUMA regions are trending down, does that mean that you'll have uh, one die, you'll just have more NUMA islands? Yeah, so that's exactly. So the question was, um, uh, what do I mean by, you know, sort of the, the uh, whole socket uh, uh, shared memory trending down? Remember that the, uh, and we'll talk about it more later, but the cost is not in flops, but it's in moving data. And that's an energy cost and a, and a time cost, a latency cost. So the idea of having really large shared memory, you know, sort of flat things is very energy inefficient. So trending uh, uh, down from that and moving toward having small islands, NUMA, having uh, understanding your locality, being able to allocate uh, chunks of your array and knowing that they're small uh, pieces that can fit in the appropriate place is where, uh, where the software is going, where our code will have to go.